three, two. Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House with Mr. Martin Popoff. Uh, good morning, Martin. Good How morning, sir. Morning, Canada. Sir. How are you doing? Yeah, do, doing good. Winter is definitely here. I'm going to get the winter tires put on soon. And uh, but yeah, looking right, forward you guys to this. Do that up by you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we do. We do it pretty early and uh, and legally you, you, you got to do it pretty early so yeah I, I think it's bc that's uh october 1st you got to get it done but here, okay that's nice early later. So, yeah. yeah i think uh when i got up this morning i think it was 37 here and yesterday morning i looked out my office window and uh, our front porch is below us and we have a little roof there and there was frost on my on my roof of my front porch i was like oh yeah. i guess we're there already so yeah, yeah, yeah no sure. denying it now so uh cool so uh we've got a very interesting topic this week this was uh, one of martin's ideas and it it kept both of us pretty busy kind of pondering it for the last week and uh the title of it is exactly as you see on the video do i trust this band slash artist and i'm actually going to let martin explain a little bit of the genesis of this topic and kind of how we got started on this and then uh, we've each got five examples that i think will take us both down some different detours that i think will make for some pretty interesting conversation so martin why don't you kind of get us started on this one yeah so so this is something i've always kind of thought of um you know and and the ones that come to mind i'll, I'll mention in my first example here i guess it's the main way of thinking about this but you know we got talking about bands that we uh uh trust implicitly to do uh to do great music even though we do we may not like it sometimes like like you get to you get to albums of theirs and you think okay these guys are consummate songwriters i know they think about it a lot you know you, you interview them this is one of the clues of these bands that you trust you interview them and they love talking about music in general other people's music more than their own music sometimes right so so there's this category of bands that I've always thought that uh, that when you when you hear albums from them and you only like half the album or two fifths or whatever, or three fifths or whatever, you, you kind of go, it's on me that I don't like them because I know I know they're making great music. They just happen to be picking some directions, unfortunately, too many directions on this album that aren't to my particular taste. But I know they're smarter than me and they're and they have great taste in music and what they're doing, they're doing very deliberately and for a reason. Um, and so I so I respect what they do. I'm just frustrated. I don't like it. And I think it's a fault within myself that I don't like it. So that's my first category here. And the first band I want to talk about a little bit in that direction is this one. Cheap Trick. So there's their first album. There's their one of their classics, right? Uh, and then you get to later ones like this, you know, special one, and uh, and we're all right, exclamation mark, right? So we're all all right. Sorry. Um, so the the interesting thing with Cheap Trick is is it really fits in this thing in that the later records, it's it happens with these bands a lot as well. Um, where they put out a lot of stuff, uh, you know, too much uh, or, or too frequently. And, you know, sometimes you think uh, when you're making excuses for them, why you don't like what they're doing. Sometimes you're thinking, um, well, they know that they made songs like this that I would like two or three of those too recently. So they have to do something different. So when they do something different on here, that's an additional reason they're doing something different is because they know they can't do, be doing the same thing all the time. And they're also doing something different because they are fearlessly creative and explorers of new music and trying new things and they're restless and stuff. So you come up with all these compliments for what they're doing. Uh, and yet uh, you're not liking it. So, so it's, you know, and again, with cheap trick, I, I think one of the things that, that you feel as well is that they've got this great history uh, they even go go back before Cheap Trick. And they also have this thing where, um, you know, those guys quietly have written some really cool songs with other artists. So, you know, you know, they're they're great songwriters and all this, you know, they're musicologists. They love their Beatles and all this sort of stuff and their power pop. And, and they've they've made obscure covers over the years. So, again, you, you keep thinking. They, they really know what they're doing. They're, they're really skilled. They're great songwriters, but they touch down too often on things that I don't like. And, and one last point with Cheap Trick, um, 
Same thing goes to production. I'm not liking the new productions very much. And um, I'm finding them kind of like uh, mid rangey, a little noisy, a little anemic, a little snappy on Dax's snare. Um, and so I start making excuses for it. I, I don't I don't think um, the production's not good because they don't know what they're doing. I think the production's not good because They've heard every production under the sun. They've tried every production under the sun. They know gear implicitly. Um, and this is something they deliberately like. They want this production sound. So, it, so it's like intentional that it's like this. So that, that thing of intention is another complimentary excuse I make for songs that I don't like. So, so quite often across these cheap trick albums, I'm only really liking half the album. Um, but... I stand back and go, I trust them. I trust that they know what they're doing. It's just not for me quite often. So that's, that's so my, a, well, actually not me, you, me issue, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'll just mention a couple of quick, um, you know, uh, uh, honorable mentions in this department, uh, the band X later on, they had some, so they had some albums that were kind of a tonal, a tonal, a little heavyish, uh, you know, a little hard to love, a little thorny. And I felt the same thing because I love X so much. I, I absolutely trust them as huge musicologists. They know the whole history of rock and roll and country music and all this put in. And then John Doe, even as a solo artist, same kind of thing. I love the songs I love on the John Doe solo albums, but there's a whole lot I don't love. Faith No More was one that came up, you know, thinking of Saul Invictus and even Album of the Year a little bit where I just I just know these guys are so hip and cool and great songwriters and I love all the early stuff. And then so when they when they make a bunch of songs and I'm not crazy about the songs, I think, well, that's just just Mike Patton being, you know, arty, being being Mr. Bungle and, and Fantoma's kind of guy. But, it, you know, not Patton being Mike not Patton, a, right? That's all you need to say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, there, there's there's a perfect example of, of where um you know, you absolutely trust this guy as an artist, but a, lo a whole lot of people can't get into Mr. Bungle or Phantomas or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, th those are a couple more examples that just kind of kind of fit in there. And, and one more I want to there's this new band, not that new, but this band I've been listening to uh, a buddy of mine from the UK, Ed Whitmore, turn me on the idols. Um, so so they're they're like um, they're like a post punk noisy they, they remind me of wire a little bit and I've been playing their stuff and, um, and love the production, just totally weird productions. So the idea here is that, um, you know, new bands that are really arty and doing cool things. I lose my own confidence about new bands thinking, well, they must know what they're doing because they've soaked in the, the history of music for the last 20 or 30 years that I've kind of, you know, not been paying as much attention to. So when they, you know, They've heard everything under the sun because everything under the sun has been done uh, sort of thing. When you think of a new band. Right. So so you think, OK, these young kids or however young they are, they don't look that young. Uh, they've got like four albums out. They've been going for 15 years or something like that. But, um, you know, you think you think um, these guys possess the knowledge of millions and millions and millions uh, more albums than the bands we love did, say, in 1995 going back to the history of, of, of rock. Right. So, so again, you, you trust, they know what they're doing because they've had so much access to information and they're deliberately doing what this band is doing now. And you go, wow, that must be true art sort of thing. I'll stop there. I have, I have more in a different direction later. Okay. Good stuff. We're off to a good start. So yeah, this, this was, uh, this was interesting to really kind of think about this and pinpoint specific artists and bands and whatnot. And I, I started thinking about like the difference between trust and just loyalty. And I think there is a difference there because trust is, you know, in your mind that they're going to make good music, regardless of whether it's your cup of tea or not, you know, just like you said before, it's, it's something in us not them. We're trusting that they're making great music. There's just going to be points where we may not be on board with that music, but we know it's good. It's just not for us. Whereas loyalty is different because you're going to listen to and, and force yourself to love no matter what, because you have this loyalty to that particular band. You're hoping they're going to make stuff that you like, but somehow you've convinced yourself. It's like, eh, even if I kind of don't like it, I'm going to like it anyway, or I'm going to convince myself that I can like it. So it's two very, very different things. 
Um, so my first example here today, this is actually the first one that came to mind. And it actually came to mind because he's got, and this is kind of a guy, right? It's, it's, a, it's a member of a band uh, and he's done lots of other things in more, well, not, not even just recent years, throughout, throughout the course of the time he's been around. The guy is Jim Matheos from Fate's Warning. Okay, so Fate's Warning, a band that's been around, geez, now almost 40 years. Uh, you know, I was on board from almost the very beginning, you know, the early days uh, with John Arch, of course, you know, The Spectre Within, Awaken the Guarding, classic albums. I trust Jim, all right? He is, he's been the driving factor behind this band. Things don't work out with band members. He brings new band members in. He brings in Ray Alder for the No Exit album. I'm digging it even heavier, more progressive, right? Along the way, we see shifts in musical style, right? Well, you know, you got these early, heavy, complicated, kind of doomy albums, very textured. Uh, and then, you know, the 90s come in, they're starting to do albums that are a little bit more accessible. I trust them, okay? I trust the band. Uh, I'm in, all right? I'm liking this. They go and take a couple steps back and they do an album that's all one long song. It's not accessible at all. So they're taking a step back from this kind of stuff. I trust them. I like this, right? Along the way, Jim starts doing other projects and things. I trust Jim, right? Driving force behind Fate's Warning. I love Fate's Warning. So he's doing stuff like OSI, okay? Which is kind of like a weird super group. Not very Fate's Warning-ish. I trust Jim. I don't know if I like this band that much. And I know Martin's a huge fan. And I know a lot of people who really like OSI. I kind of like the first album. It's okay. I really don't like the subsequent albums. But I trust Jim. And I know this is good music. And it's different music. And it's okay to be different from the main band. I just don't really care for it much. It's not really my cup of tea. But I know it's good. And I know this is all about me, right? So Fate's Warning, go continue. They put out more stuff. Some albums are better than others. Uh, I don't like all of them a ton compared to some of the classic ones. But I trust Jim and I trust the band. It's, it's good music. Eh, not my favorites. Now, in later, later years, they're putting out really, really strong late period albums. And again, another one of those bands that uh, are, have had a kind of second life in later years. Uh, and I trust that they will do that. All right. And they have So their later albums are among some of their better. Now, you know, we hear news that uh, Fate's Warning as a recording uh, band are probably not going to continue. We may see some live stuff from them. But as as far as a, being a band to make records, not going to happen. I trust that Jim, being the great writer and musician and thinker that he is, and I've read the, the biography and you get all this insight into him. I trust that he's going to continue to do, if there's no more Fate's Warning, he's going to continue to do other projects that will be just equally as impressive, right? He's put out some solo albums in fairly recent times. I don't particularly care for them. They are really good. They're meticulously crafted. He's a great guitar player. There's lots of textures and things. There's some like classical and folky stuff and it's very kind of new agey. It's not really my cup of tea, but it's excellently done, expertly done. And I trust that he will probably continue to do more albums along that same vein. May not be for me, right? He does another project called Tuesday the Sky, which is even more kind of like electronic-y, ambient, atmospheric than OSI. You can imagine what my opinion is of that. It's well made. I trust that he will continue to do oddball things like that. I'm really not along for the ride there. However, and the reason why he sprang to mind for this immediately, he's doing another project now called the Kings of Mercia, which is like catchy melodic rock, right? With uh, uh, Chris Overland, the singer from FM, Joey Vera's on board here, Simon Phillips on drums. On paper, I was kind of like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm going to like that. But I trust Jim. I know Jim always produces quality. I may not always be on board. So I went in a little skeptical with this. And you know what? I really like this a lot. It's catchy. It's big and bright. It's not Fate's Warning at all. It's not metal. 
it's you know if you like fm it's kind of very catchy upbeat bright melodic rock with jim matthews crunching away on the guitars but it's not really metal and the more i listen to this the more i like it and i'm thinking this is why i trust jim matthews because even if i don't really dig everything he does i know it's quality and i know that he's putting out good music it's just not all for me but I can easily, that's why I will easily recommend any project he's done because I know I trust him and I know it's good. I'm just not on board for all of it. I'll stop there. Interesting. And and that that sort of more poppy accessible project thing, if that was if that was for like 25 year olds in in white t-shirts and sweatpants, you know, that you've never heard of, right? Just some kids making that music. You know, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't buy into it. You'd say this Probably is from not. a whole world I'm not into. But because I trust Jim, I know it's done well. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up OSI and, and that got me thinking of of the trusting of, you know, I, I'm on board and I've gained a ton of trust when Kevin Moore leaves Dream Theater, when Bill Bruford leaves. Yes. When Peter Gabriel leaves Genesis. It's like I, I now trust these guys even more. Because it's like it's like you know you know they're on a, they they have great taste that that they feel like um you know the music I want to make is is got to be twice as good as this and to and to make that music I got to leave right yeah. Yeah. they're kind of thinking right so yeah. all right so my next one um the theme here is losing trust um and uh, my main example of this and this is all tied up uh the most extreme examples are also tied up in uh you know people have heard me blather on about there's only two bands i've ever considered absolute geniuses um and that's um basically judas priest in the 70s and queen in the 70s right um where where i consider this run of enough albums to, to show that it's not accidental uh you know proving that you guys are operating you know this this band is operating on a plane way above everybody else you know you can't touch them what they're doing where did it come from nobody knows the, the sad part with priest is that the the number of times i've tried to get them to kind of articulate where that came from they can't do it and 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 to, to my mind i've been disappointed in that um it made me think well, maybe it was a little accidental with Priest and they aren't geniuses, right? So I lose trust in Priest when, you know, I still remember it like like the day it, day it happened um, when British Steel comes out and, you know, they make, as, as I call it, you know, the first Judas Priest Kiss album, right? Um, so Judas Priest, you know, basically... I've lost trust in, in them as immortal gods, you know, you know, pulling pulling music out of the sky like Jimi Hendrix did, um, you know, through those 70s albums and thinking, ah, they're just a band now that I really like, but they're flesh and blood. They're human. Right. Um, and the same thing happened with Queen. Queen. Queen were like absolute geniuses operating on this plane. Nobody can touch them. You know, they're like three times as good as Led Zeppelin. They're killing Led Zeppelin at everything Led Zeppelin did or whatever. Killing Sweet at what Sweet does. Um, but uh, but the, but then all of a sudden they become mortal. And I go, well, they obviously can make mistakes and they can make lots of mistakes. And Brian May all of a sudden barely ever plays like Brian May anymore. Right. Um, and and literally they could still make heavy songs and he can't play like Brian May anymore. And those heavy songs aren't even written like the old heavy songs. Right. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between headlong and stone cold crazy. Right. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and and um, and so this this is the uh, the idea of uh, sadly, there are these bands uh, and there's very few examples. Um, oh, I'll mention another one in a sec, but there's very few examples, I suppose, of these bands that I that I trusted, but, but we're talking about a, 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 a up ratcheted level of trust to, to genius. I basically trusted them as being, um, absolute, you know, 180 IQs across the board sort of thing. Right. Um, an extreme level of trust, basically thinking this is the best run of records anybody's, you know, and that's when I bring in that that sort of idea of objective versus subjective, right? People can say, oh, the Stones albums in a row or the Bob Dylan albums in a row or whatever, or U2 at their peak or whatever. But my point is that even on an objective level, Queen 
and uh, and and Priest are like everybody can sort of sit back and be super impressed with that, right? Whereas with Rolling Stones, you got You got to like buy into the whole world of the Stones, and it's it's abstract art versus realism, right? It's the idea of you know this big emotional philosophical strange thing and picking out the players and and the uniqueness of Charlie Watts and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so so the one uh, the one other band I want to mention in this um uh in this category is Iron Maiden. So Iron Maiden is not exactly in this category because I never considered them geniuses, right? I basically, I list, I love all of those first five Maiden albums in a row. I think they're one of the greatest bands going, but they, the, but they seemed like regular flesh and blood guys just making amazing, amazing, amazing music. They, they didn't seem like aliens, right? Um, so all those records in a row are great. But but, you know, you get to the end of Power Slave and it's like, OK, everything they did from there on out is kind of like a repeat of most of the same tricks all over again. Right. A after after Nico comes into the band and they make two records like that with this really interesting, distinct chemistry, almost like a who like chemistry that they have between, you know, Steve and Nico and, and just everything about them, this really great lead singer and this twin lead idea and all this stuff. And there's all this great, great songwriting. Basically um, they, they essentially become <clears throat> a band that uh, it, it turns out that they've shown you all their, all their cards. They've shown you all their tricks. They've really got none left. They still make a bunch of great music and, Frankly, I, I like I like the last five Maiden albums better than the the five after um, after after Power Slave. Uh, essentially, you know, you really lose trust in Steve as a writer when you get to the Blaze Bailey albums or or no no prayer for the dying, right? Um, and then you know, God knows, there's tons of Maiden fans that will complain up and down about pick any one of the the later ones, Brave New World on sort of thing, right? Um, so so that's a band where where it's like um, I loved everything they did. They were they were incredible. Didn't really consider them geniuses, but then then you just sort of lose trust that they could even operate at their at their old level all the time, and and you think ah they they've kind of you know there's a limit to their intelligence kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm, I, I don't want to sound like a massive complainer about Maiden because I, I actually really like most of the later stuff a lot more than even that middle stuff. And I think, I think they make amazing stuff, but they're essentially the same new wave of British heavy metal band they've always been. So has Maiden crossed over into the loyalty category for many? Of yeah, them. it, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's, there's definitely a loyalty there. You want to love it. So that's the other thing with the loyalty thing. You want to love it. You're disappointed when you don't love it. You're, you're just, just really bummed out that, that when, when you hear a bunch of Maiden songs that you don't like from, from later years and you champion them, you're so happy for all those songs that you do love. Yeah. I mean, and you make a really good point not to deviate the, this whole conversation, but like, a lot of their albums in more recent years, there's a sameness to all of them, right? You're not, there's no real big surprises. And I'm amazed when, you know, someone will say, oh my God, Sinjutsu is awful. The last couple albums were so much better. And to me, I'm like, there's really not that much difference between these last couple albums, right? So what, what makes one so much more awful than the others? I struggle with when I hear people say stuff like that. So I don't know. Because to me, if you like one of them, they're, they're all good, right? They all have their, their good points and their weak points, but they're all very much cut from the same cloth. So I don't know. I, I mean, for me, Maiden is completely a, a loyalty thing. I have a lot of bands that I, I have this loyalty towards. And like I said, it's like you, you give every album a fair shake. Uh, most of the time, I never say I dislike any of them. Uh, I find lots to like in them. I find some stuff to not like about them. I don't complain about them much. And then I move on and I wait for the next one. Right. And we do yeah. that year after year after year, album after album after album. It's yeah. like, we're there through thick and thin, whatever you want to give us. We'll either really like it or we will, or maybe we won't like it that much, but we'll be waiting for the next one. We'll go see you on tour. And it's like, we're, we're here. We're Maiden fans. We're loyal. That's it. So I think that's different than trust, right? Because with trust, we we think and hope that everything's going to be close to that genius thing. It's We trust it's going to be great music every time around. Loyalty, we're kind of like, yeah, it may not be that good, but we're still on board anyway. So yeah, yeah. it's a fine line. So uh, how about a band where you trusted them a lot, and then you lost the trust 
and then you regained it once again. All right, that's my next pick here. So I learned uh, back in the old days, in the 80s, that I really liked and really trusted a band called Marillion. And I thought their early music was just fantastic. Uh, old school prog, but with an 80s twist. You had this amazingly charismatic singer named Derek Dick, otherwise known as Fesh. Uh, very cool albums with long songs, a nod to Genesis and Prague Giants of the 70s, but they sounded original, uh, you know, script for a jester's tear, obviously um, misplaced childhood, Fugazi, clutching its draws, seminal albums, in my opinion. And uh, to me, these guys could do no wrong. Man, I trusted that they were just going to make kick ass music time and time again. And then, you know, you get the dreaded news. And back in the old days, you hear it way after it actually happens that uh, your favorite singer in their in the band is no longer in the band you're like what massive disappointment oh do i trust that they will find someone else and continue on and be as good anymore i don't know i don't know martin i, I don't know if i trust them that much yet because i haven't been a fan for that long yet so they come out with uh, a follow-up which is really good and you're like ah oh, great steve hogarth yeah he sounds good he's not really fish but i like it this is good they put out a couple albums afterwards and all of a sudden the music doesn't really sound like the old music anymore. And Hogarth is great, but he's not overly distinctive. And, you know, quite frankly, at the time, early nineties, I'm getting into all sorts of great old prog and new prog. I'm discovering progressive rock, you know, fully for the first time ever. I'm moving away from metal for a little bit and I'm deciding that, um, I no longer trust Marillion to make progressive rock music that I like anymore because all of a sudden the music is atmospheric and it's kind of poppy. And then, you know, in the latter part of the decade, they release a couple albums like, you know, Radiation and Marillion.com and Adarachnophobia where they're integrating like <gasps> alternative rock elements. And I'm like, I don't trust these guys to make music that I like anymore. I don't. I don't, I don't even, to me, I don't even know. I can't even say that I trust that they're making good music because I've heard from other people that they don't like this direction of Marillion. So I'm like, okay, I've totally lost trust in Marillion. I've moved on to other things and they keep releasing albums and I occasionally buy them and I listen to them and I'm like, I don't really like this at all. And it goes on the shelf. I never listen to it again. And then uh, all of a sudden, like, you know, many years later, um, you start talking to some people who's, opinions you really trust and they talk about how great Marillion has been over the last decade or so and how they trust them no matter what they do I trust that they knew that they needed to change from the old days into the new style and you're like and you hear that often enough and you're like thinking well I lost my trust but this person and that person they never did and they kept with them am I missing something here so you go and like all right let me go investigate some of this newer music because quite frankly everything that i heard previous from this era of the band has kind of really bored me and i just you know and i started i got back into metal again and i'm like ah you know so you start checking out albums like this and you know like this and all of a sudden thinking all right i'm a bit older now i'm a bit more open to certain things this isn't that bad I'm trying to work on my trust with Marillion, Martin. And then they come out with a with a brand new album this year. And I said, all right, I'm going to buy it. And I really like it. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, hmm, maybe the issue was never with, with them. It was with me. Because I went back and looked at this whole chunk of time that I kind of fell out of trust with Marillion. And I was going through some stuff musically on my own with what I was listening to, what I was liking, what I was not liking. And I'm just thinking that for some reason, Marillion just didn't fit with some of these changes that I was going through in my listening habits and listening patterns. And it was maybe never about them. It was about me. And so now I can go and listen to some of these albums that I didn't even give a chance to and think that's pretty good. And I think, you know what? I think I trust them again. I trust them that what they're doing now is what they really want to do. And it's actually pretty good music. And a lot of people out there really love it. This band could have kind of folded and disappeared after Fish left. And 
That was not the case. If anything, they're more popular now than they ever were back then to an, to an extent. Uh, and they have really, really loyal fans who trust them implicitly. And I'm thinking, I, I, I'm on board with trusting these guys again. I still don't like Marillion.com or Anarachnophobia at all, but uh, the rest of the stuff I can totally get into. So yeah, so I have regained my trust with the guys in Marillion. And uh, I'm pretty happy to say that I have. You bring up a great point here about a different kind of trust, which is trusting, uh, trusting a critic that you respect or someone who you think is really smart or who can articulate or, you know, either write a writer, good review of a Marillion album that that sucks you in and, and basically convinces you points out things that um, you might have missed. But but now you're noticing them. Yeah, they they could be completely material things about uh, you know guest stars on stuff or a certain you know guitar effect that they used for the first time or they used a lot or how they did yeah. this or that um, <clears throat> you know reverse recording whatever. Um, but yeah, so so that's an interesting one where um, you know people have certain critics that they trust. Um, and uh, and they're basically going to follow their lead a little bit or at least give the band or the album the benefit of the doubt um, because of because of this review. But uh, I, I feel that way when reading reviews about anything, you know, um, books, poetry, movies, whatever. Right. Um, you know, the, the more the more detailed stuff that someone points out for for you to look into on that certain thing, you know, that that's going to get you into it as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, and I need to point out one person in particular, I mean, there were, there were many, but there was one person in particular who really kind of pushed me back into the direction of Marillion. That's our very own Stephen Reed, uh, who have for, for like a decade had been telling me, it's like, really, you don't like the Marillion stuff anymore. And, you know, and here he is reviewing on our website, you know, all yeah. giving, you know, four out of five, five out of five star review to all these recent Marillion albums. And I'm kind of like, you know, and I would always give all of them a cursory listen, but I was like, God, I'm, I'm not hearing this. Like what, what, and then, you know, so it's almost like he kind of, his positive reinforcement kind of convinced me at some point that I, you know what, I need to just give this stuff a chance again. I mean, really give it a chance. And, uh, and it, it worked, it worked. And, and like I said, I just, I realized that it, the music was always pretty damn good. It was just me. Because I was listening to different type of stuff and I, you know, I was holding on desperately to this notion of what Marillion should sound like based on how much I love the 80s albums with Fish, right? And at some point you got to stop and say, just like with anything, it's like, well, you know what? They're not that band anymore. And, you know, sometimes you move on from bands, right? Because they just, they're not playing the type of music you like anymore. You move on. But I was like, I, I, I held on to that, what I wanted them to sound like so badly and so hard that I couldn't open up my ears and my mind to what they were doing now and now have been doing for 30 years that to say, you know what, this is pretty good too. It's different, but it's really good. It's quality, you know? So I, I, I learned because I, you know, there's sometimes you say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, sometimes you can, I guess, right? This is a perfect example. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so my next category is Bands that I didn't trust before or the idea of trust never entered my mind, but then I started to trust them. And that would be the cult. You know, you got the early stuff, Dream Time. You've got, you know, the, the big one where they were the it band, Electric. And then some of the later stuff, Beyond Good and Evil. And the one that kind of turned the tide, uh, the, the cult. So so it's interesting. Um I remember, you know, we, we've we've both talked to Jamie Laszlo about the cult before, um, but, uh, you know, and, and he loves this album. And, uh, you know, and the idea was when this album came out, it was it was kind of ugly music, hard to love, a little bit alternative, a little bit caveman, -y, tribal, uh, all these things, a uh, little atonal. Um, but, you know, I started respecting them at that point and thinking, OK, you know, they're they're fearless lovers of music. They're they're looking for something else. They're restless. Uh, and then and then, you know, the later albums, they just got better and better. Although, you know, there was a little bit of a return to kind of more rocking out or whatever. But but the point is, is that, you know, they were just another band that I liked quite a bit through the 80s kind of thing thing and I'm, I'm into these albums and they're pretty cool and they're heavy and they're a little different they're not exactly heavy metal band blah 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 right. um but but i just thought they were like normal guys making pretty good music but then you know and, and so here's another example interviewing ian asbury and, and and like realizing what a what a passionate honest 
thinking, thoughtful guy that guy is and, and how into music he is and how important music is to his life. Uh, and he's had a very colorful life as well. Um, but he just strikes me as one of these guys that you probably could just talk about music and, and he'd never even want to talk about the cult for two hours. Right. Um, and, and so when you get these guys who are that enthusiastic about music um, and then, and then these albums are coming out and they're, and they're kind of like under the radar um, and, and you're just really liking them. And all of a sudden you're going, okay, okay I, I kind of trust everything this band does. And, you know, and fortunately in the cults, in, in the cults case, um, the kind of music that they like to make most of the time, I like anyway, so that's good. So, so there aren't these albums where three fifths of the album I don't like, and I'm kind of disappointed. I'm I'm more like on board with four sixths of of the album at least, sort of thing, two thirds or whatever that is, right? So, um, so this is a band that uh, so the category here is didn't really think about trust, didn't trust them, never crossed my mind to have that debate. Now, now that I trust him. And one other one that I thought of in that direction is like a John Mellencamp, right? So so coming up in the 80s, he was like Bruce Springsteen light, you know, annoying. He's got all these hits there. I'm hearing him too many times. He's much better than Brian Adams, but he's not as good as Bruce Springsteen. He's he's not that wise a man. He's he's like he's like just, you know, he's he's a pop guy. He's Mr. Heartland. He's kind of wise. He's kind of smart. Right. But then as time goes on, and I see him live and I was totally sold by seeing him live as well. As time goes on, he like he like grows into the the wise man on the mount uh, shoes. Right now. Now, I think he is as as cool as Bruce Springsteen. And so so I absolutely trust that he knows what he's doing. You know, he got less commercial over time and he got more of like a like a cross between a Bob Dylan and a Bruce Springsteen. Right. So so the early records, you know, and he even he, he even as a, as a metaphor for this whole journey, he, he even goes through different names, right? He's John Cougar, then he's John Cougar Mellencamp, and then he's John Mellencamp, Mellencamp right? Yeah. So, so that so that's like a metaphor for this journey into trust, right? Um, and and so so now I just think he's like this this amazing literary, you know, Woody Guthrie, um, John Steinbeck, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, rock, you know. A, you know, liter literary god of 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 writing about you know America, right? But but before it's like he's just kind of annoying. He was just just like this this guy that you just want to swat aside and you know ah Jack and Diane's playing again, right? <laughs> little Pink Houses is playing again, right? Um, so uh, so yeah, that's a funny one. That's a little bit like the cult. Uh, you know, both the cult and John Mellencamp to me are like rock gods now, and and before it's like they were just incidental. They were just kind of there. Yeah, I would. I, the cult is an interesting one. I would kind of agree with you. I don't think I've ever. I, I've you know what over the years, I listened to the cult very kind of like sporadically. So there was no trust there at all. I'd be like if I if I had the inclination to buy one of their albums because I heard one of the songs and I really liked it, I'd buy it. But I went for like stretches where I didn't buy or listen to anything by them. Uh, it wasn't until more recent years where I started like kind of catching up on the catalog and thinking, all right. I kind of see it now. This is a band if I would have kept up with, you know, but I remember like the first two albums or so back in the day, I didn't like it all. I now I find lots to like there, but back in the day, it's like, I like the heavier stuff. And, and then they kind of changed direction a little bit. got a little weird and they got heavy again. And even like, I, I mean, I just got the new one. I don't know if you've heard this yet, Martin. Um, interesting. Yeah. And you know, what's it got in common with clutch, right? short album short, right just yeah. oh that short album that just drives me crazy i don't know you know what it is that's that's like that that's probably a, a whole other show but like we praise bands that do 45 minute albums but a 30 or 35 minute album is too short it's like we want i think we want like album length like you know what we grew up with album length which was you know 40 45 minutes we want that we don't want 70 minute albums we don't want 30 minute albums either but yeah this is like it's eight songs compact i think is this even 35 minutes i don't even think it's 35 i minutes. think it's about that yeah yeah um it's got some good stuff on it but it's it's decidedly less heavy than the last couple and it's more i think to me i get i don't want to blow too much up on this because i'm going to probably review it next week but uh it reminds me of the, the first couple albums a little bit more there's lots of textures and space and whatever i like it uh it's, 
I don't know if I love it yet. But I trust that if you had them explain why they did what they did, we'd be okay with they, it, right? They, okay. they would mention a bunch of obscure stuff that goes right over your head, and you go, "Wow, I never would have thought of that." Right? Oh, okay. But well, when, when you it. Think, now I get it. Yeah, exactly. But when you but when you think of trying to get Judas Priest to explain why they did a certain song on Firepower, you don't trust that the explanation is going to be that deep, right? Okay. That's the problem, right? So there you go. There, there's the there's the trusting that these guys are massive musicologists versus another band where you where you go. Ah, I kind of know why they did it, and there's not really much to it, right? It's like they they explain why they did Nostradamus. I don't care what the explanation is, man. I'm yeah. I'm not on board with it, regardless. So yeah. yeah. All right, uh, I have another example here of a a guy in a major band who in my mind uh, is pretty much a genius and I have for, you know, 45 years or so have basically trusted anything he's done. I buy just about anything him or the band does. And uh, again, I may not a hundred percent love all of it, but I trust that no matter what he and the band come up with, I trust that it's going to be great music. Right. So the who and Pete Townsend, all right, basically. Uh, who doesn't trust Pete Townsend? I mean, I, he's one of those guys that we hold in such high regard, whether it's, you know, the 60s albums, which are all fun, whether it's the Tommy or Quadrophenia or Who's Next. I mean, this is just great stuff. Uh, I even trust the band when they're in the latter stages of the life of Keith Moon and they're, you know, they're getting older. It's the end of the 70s, music changing. I, you know, I trust it because it's the who. And it's like, and you know, I'm, I'm on board. Keith dies and they get in, you know, replacement, Kenny Jones, very different drummer. I trust the who are still going to make quality, majestic, classy music, classy music. I'm not a big fan of either of these albums. I, I know you love them, Martin. Uh, I don't dislike them. I'm just not. I've never listened to these and I like a little more. I, I miss Keith Moon and the band, but you know what? I trust Townsend so much. And I know the songwriting is good on here. It's just a who for kind of like a different era. It's a more grown up who I get it. I, I trust him. I trust the band. I trust that even, even though they're going to go decades without releasing new music and they'll put out new stuff. I trust that it's good. It is good. I almost never listened to these. But I know it's good music. It's more me, right? I have this thing in my head of what the Who should always sound like. They don't always sound like that. And they don't sound like that anymore. But it's still really good music. Uh, I even trust that he's going to put out solo albums that sometimes just kind of go over my head. And I'm, I'm like, I like, like you said, I like some of the songs on some of the solo albums. I don't like some songs on the solo albums. But you know what? I know that this is Townsend's genius that's rising to the top again, as always. And I'm just, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to trust that even if I'm not 100% hearing what I should be hearing, because I know and I trust that he's creating high art with these albums. I mean, I like all of it, but I know I'm going to like a lot of it. And I trust that he will continue doing that for as long as he wants to. And I know if The Who put out another album at some point, you know, before they call it quits officially, I trust that it's going to be good. I trust the fact that I'm going to buy it. And I trust the fact that I'm probably going to like a good chunk of it will i ever think that it's going to be as great as quadrophenia tommy who's next and some of those albums no but i trust pete townsend and i know that it will be worth listening to regardless yeah you know and and pete i think the reason the reason he you, you know you, you trust him is the guy just seems to be so much about art. He just loves art in, in all its forms. Everything, you know, he's a multimedia kind of guy. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit of, of, of these guys. Like I say, when, when you, when you see Bill Bruford leave, yes. And, and that, that whole example of those guys, you know, you go, wow, these guys really love art. You know, they're, they're willing to, you know, throw away something, a, a sure, a sure bet for, um, you know, for something else, because they love art so much. Right. So Pete experiments a lot. Right. And and, you know, and, and there's something to be said for the fact that, you know, the who doesn't put out a lot of albums. So it's it's like he's not just cranking them out because, you know, it, it he, he probably really suffers for those songs yeah. uh, to, to come out. Right. So. Yeah. All right. So my next uh, my next category is uh, trust never crossed my mind one way or another. 
other. And uh, oddly enough, this is most of my favorite big bands. So, uh, you know, Deep Purple. So there we got Deep Purple, uh, Perfect Strangers, or otherwise known as Perfect Wheelchairs, when they, they, they made fun of Deep Purple and Krang for being an old band, right? Back all right, 1984, 40 years ago, they were calling them Perfect Wheelchairs. Um, Fireball. So, uh, you know, the idea here, you know, most of my big favorite bands, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Sabbath, ZZ Top or whatever. I just consider these guys um, great bands. And uh, and I loved most of the music that they put out. And uh, I, I never I never trusted them one album to the next, thinking that it was going to be amazing. It's just I'm glad it was because I considered them, you know, I would I would read interviews or uh, or even maybe even just in the nature of the music where you would feel that there's a little bit of an accidental thing. You know, maybe maybe they're just like they're, they're you know, you read about maybe the drugs and the booze and just the regular lives or the broken relationships or whatever. And you just think these are regular guys. They just happen to be really talented. They're not geniuses. Um, they just happen to make, you know, good music most of the time. And, um, and so it, so it was never a case of uh, having so much trust that I knew the next thing they were going to do was going to be great. I was just glad it was great when it did happen. Um, so it wasn't a case of trusting them a lot early and having them lose trust, you know, deep purple is a funny case where, um, you know, all of those recent albums, they, they certainly really seem to have found a sound and, and they keep drilling into and getting more and more and more of a sound, which is really interesting to hear from those guys in their seventies. Um, but, uh, but, to, but to me, they're still mortals. They're still, they're still guys just, just making really, really good records. And, uh, so, so it never had that massive, you know, queen Judas priest thing going on with it or, or, um, you know, or, or now I just think they're geniuses or anything like that. I, I don't think they're geniuses. And that goes with most of these bands. You know, I, 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 I thought of, you know, how do I put Thin Lizzy into this? How do I put Genesis or yes into it? How do I put Megadeth into it? Right. Um, just uh, just high percentage bands and they and they turn out to these, be these bands I really like. But yeah, so so this whole concept of this episode doesn't really enter into these bands. I guess that's all I'll say. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, Deep Purple is a fascinating one. I think for me, it's it's part trust and part loyalty, right? Because mm -hmm. you have such history with a band and me, I'm going to buy what they put out. No, I mean, Shit, I bought out I bought that cover thing that they did, the covers album that they did recently, which is terrible, right? But I bought it. I knew I was gonna buy it, regardless, because I gotta I gotta have everything that they do. So there's that loyalty yeah. there. But you know, in most cases, like from like day one that Steve Morse joined the band, you know, a lot of people were like, ah, there's no Blackmore, I'm done. I trust the rest of the guys in that band because to me, as much as I'm a Blackmore lover and cherish all those albums that he appeared on it's like there's more to deep purple than just richie blackmore i trust ian gill and ian pace and john lord and roger glover i trust that they will continue on and put out new music that still represents the legacy of deep purple and they haven't let me down you know is the music a little different sure it is of course you know you got one important member who's not there anymore he's got different flavors going on but i've always trusted that they will do what's right for deep purple so with me, it's it's both. I, I'm loyal to whatever they're going to do. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to force myself to listen to it and and digest it and whatnot. But I also trust that they're going to put out, you know, as the best music they possibly can, year in and year out. Yeah. One extra thing about Purple that I, that I do trust them about is um, they've always had this idea that. Um, the, the the albums will have a minimum level of quality that is pretty high um and that's that's something i've even felt about aerosmith even when i don't like uh you know some of their albums and i think they're actually terrible albums or whatever right y you still feel like a whole bunch of work went into it they probably threw out a lot of material to come up with what they did um you know outside songwriters they they sweated those songs they took a long time to put out and, and purple kind of feels that way as well and i always think of aerosmith in that in that uh example too because even when they 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 seem to be completely incapable uh, as human beings you know night in the ruts rock rock in a hard place um maybe maybe done with mirrors to some extent um you know it it's still like 
how did they make a record this good? You know, I mean, it being this much of a shambles, like rock in a hard place doesn't even have the two main guitarists and Steven's almost dead at that point. Right. Yeah. And yet this album comes out and you go, wow, this is like really well put together. This sounds, you know, like they have had their, had their powder dry sort of thing. Right. And so deep purple, you know, when people put down house of blue, blue light, for example, or who, who do we think we are? It's like, it's like, I'm thinking, these are still super high quality albums. It's like you're complaining for other reasons about them. And, and maybe those other reasons are a little bit of this. Um, maybe, maybe the songwriting isn't as good or whatever, or, or you or can quite frankly, they're, they're not as good as the album that came before them. Cause that seems to be what people nitpick about with those. Two yeah. Albums. Yeah. And you know, you hear, you hear way too much with purple about them just hanging out at the bar. Right. It just, it just sounds like, you know, they're always loaded when they're making albums or whatever. Right. And, and it's like just a casual thing. And, ah, oh, we just broke into a jam and came up with this song or whatever. So, so that stuff sinks in after a while too, where, where you think, okay, well, they, they love what they're doing, but, but maybe sometimes it, it you know, there's, there's this, this story of the happy drunks making these records or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yep. But uh, but yeah, just uh, just a band I've always thought were just normal guys, right? Normal guys. Yep. Yeah. All right. So my next choice here is going to kind of go back to an individual who, regardless of what kind of band he's in. Well, I mean, there's really two, one band we're talking about here. But here's a guy that I trust that no matter who he surrounds himself with, or who he doesn't surround himself with. Uh, I always trust that the music is going to be quality and that his contributions will always be absolutely top notch. I'm not always on board with the overall picture of it, but I know that what he's doing on, on the album is always going to be really, really good. The guy is Jeff Lynn. I'm mainly talking about ELO, right? But, uh, you know, even back to the early days when he was with The Move, uh, there was something special about this guy. And you knew that he had it, right? So even though some of these, you know, I like The Move, but some of the stuff is a little weird and a little out there, right? But then, of course, you know, The Move breaks up and they go on, they form uh, Electric Light Orchestra. The early stuff is really just strange mixing of rock and classical and chamber music. And it's just, it's bizarre. It's oddly intriguing. Uh but you know this guy, he's there's something about him, right? He appreciates great pop music. He loves the Beatles, right? He loves classical music. So it's been interesting to follow the career of this electric light orchestra in general to see them kind of move from this very kind of different, very English classical rock type of thing to then start to incorporate soaring pop hooks and lots of um, synthesizer technology and orchestrations and whatnot. You know, and they become like one of the, the the first major, you know, rock bands, pop rock bands that incorporate, you know, their own little mini orchestra and, you know, up to the minute uh, cutting edge synthesizer technology. And they put out these great pop albums. They incorporate like, you know, a little bit of disco music. And all of a sudden you're thinking like, wow, it's like no matter which avenue he's taking this band, I'm trusting that it's it's going to be good. You know, and, and up to this point, you know, this is, you know, there's a lot of disco on this album. And I'm like, oddly enough, and I'm not really a disco fan. I like this. I think I trust this guy, no matter what he's doing, you know. And then, you know, they move into the 80s and all of a sudden he's taking away a lot of those kind of classical parts. The orchestrations are gone. Now it becomes more of like a, you know, a rock band or a pop band that uses lots of synthesizers and uh, electronic drum beats and things like that. And you're like, all right. I kind of like this too. I trust that he's nobody knows what he's doing. His vocals still sound amazing. You can tell he's still writing very intelligently and arranging very intelligently, but he's changing with the times. I trust that. I may not be a hundred percent as on board with this stuff as I was with the early stuff, but I'm okay with it. Breaks the band up. Okay. Starts to do things like traveling Wilburys. I'm not on board with traveling Wilburys, right? It's not really my cup of tea. But I know it's quality and I know that he's working with legends in that band. Right. And tons of people are loving it. I, I still trust this guy. I, you know, it, that's not really he's he's now going in directions that I'm musically not on board with. But I know it's good. You know, I, I will never tell anybody that the Travis Wilburys suck. 
I just don't listen to him because I don't really like it. It's not really come on a cup, my cup of tea. He puts out some solo albums, which are kind of along that, that line. He works with George Harrison, right? Not all that is really to my liking, but I know he puts his stamp on it. You can hear that he's writing the songs, helping with the arrangements. You can hear his vocals. He puts ELO back together again, right? Jeff Lynn's Electric Light Orchestra. All the old band is gone. It's basically just him doing everything. There's elements there. Again, it's all about his contributions, his vocals sound exactly the same, spot on. The melodies, the hooks, they're there. The arrangements, they're there. There's no strings or barely any. Sometimes it's barely synthesized. There's a lot of acoustic guitar work. So to me, a lot of the elements that the whole package are kind of gone, is stripped away. But the idea of what the Electric Light Orchestra should be based on him are still there. And I trust that that will always be the case. So I still buy these. I don't maybe love them as much as the early stuff, not even close. But there's, there's oddly enough, there's enough to intrigue me here because of him and because I trust his musical vision and his skills. And I know that anything he works with is going to be really, really good, not just for me, but for lots of other people. And, and I trust that this guy is going to, his name is going to be attached to quality, song craft, melodic music, whatever it is he decides to do. So I, I have always trusted Jeff Lynn without, without fault, always. And, and that will always be the case. Cool. All right. Well, I'll move on to my last one. Cause I, I feel like I've been yapping too too long, so I, and I'll keep this one short as well. Um, so my last category is bands I trust that I really don't pay a lot of attention to. Um, so Tool is my is my prime example of this. So there there's there's your reticulated deal there. Some early Tool, some later Tool. Um, so the idea here is there's bands that I know are absolute. You know, we we could probably put Tool in that genius category, right? Um, this, this you know where very few bands are in. I, I actually that's a pretty safe bet. Uh, you know, they they belong there. Um, so so there's these bands that I know what they're doing is amazing. Everybody tells me what they're doing is amazing. Um, highly highly critically acclaimed bands. Um, but I've just never really gone whole in. You know, I've spent a fair number of hours with Tool, but um. I've never gone whole in and learned these bands completely. You know, you can think of many, many critically acclaimed bands, you know, Wilco, um, Depeche Mode, Radiohead, just the whole, there's a, there's a litany of these bands. And then there's bands that I, I would stand my ground and say, you know, like talking heads or something like that, where, where I would say, no, I'll stand my ground and say it's overrated or I don't think they're that all that great. Right. But there are these bands that, you know, quite often I'll, I'll, you know, type out in Facebook or whatever and say, oh, that's a retirement band for me, right? Where you say, I could literally take up Tool and listen to Tool for the rest of my life. And that's the only band I listen to. And it's probably a, a lifetime's worth of study because I'm so behind the eight ball. and I know there's so much to know and learn and respect about them, right? Um, so, yeah, that's my last category. Bands that um, I absolutely, totally trust and just don't listen to. Yeah, there's the, those those albums are so dense and layered. It's yeah, you could literally spend months on it just listening to that. Those, I mean, they don't even have a lot of albums, but there's like so much music on them. It's crazy. That's a good choice. How about an artist that you trust? No questions asked. And then the more you think about it, the more you're kind of like, God, there's a lot of this music from this guy I don't even really like, but I trust him. You know, it's 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 like reputation, right? You know that there's enough of his his uh, discography that you do like, but the more you kind of look into it, you're like, ah, God, I don't hardly listen to anything this guy puts out. That guy is Todd Rundgren. I love Todd Rundgren. Todd Rundgren not only has been hailed as you know one of the great songwriters of all time, one a, a excellent producer and arranger. Uh, he's got some classic albums, you know, the early, you know, Wizard of True Star, something, anything, uh, you know, he's done some great stuff with Utopia, right? That first Utopia album, uh, you know, a whole bunch of Utopia, you know, taking, taking Utopia, the band from being a prog band to like, almost like a kind of like a new wave power pop band. Uh, his solo stuff has run the gamut from singer songwriter to rock to psychedelic rock to like Motown stuff to electronic. Um, you know, he did an acapella album, which is all vocals, 
really odd but intriguing. He's done like really weird electronic pop albums. Uh, he's returned to like, you know, hard rock. He's done just weird shit, you know, all this, all these weird albums that, you know, he did this whole Beatles kind of play on the Beatles for Deface the Music. He's done like hip hop. He's done like uh, ambient electronic music and just all sorts of weird stuff. This probably, if you look at his discography on everything he's ever done, I probably listen and like very little of it. But yet I will go and talk to people about Todd Rundgren like he's one of the greatest geniuses of all time. And I trust that no matter what he's going to do, it's going to be really good. There's a good chance I won't like it, though. But I'll still say it's really good. And I trust that he will put out quality. And uh, I'm amazed at like how much I continue to keep buying Todd Rundgren music and how very little of it I actually really like much at all. I mean, granted, there's some that I really like, enjoy a lot. But, uh, but I trust this guy because I know in my mind, he is a true musical genius and visionary. And I know I should trust him. I'm just not on board with a lot of it at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one that came to mind a little bit like that for me is Bjork. I've been playing quite a bit, quite a bit of Bjork lately. And um, although, although I probably like a very high percentage of Bjork stuff, but again, it, it's a little bit like a Todd where she'll try a whole bunch of different things. Right. And, uh, and it's just all, all in the pursuit of art but it, it could be radically different than other things she does. She's done or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just one of these, these fearlessly creative people that uh, could be, could be all over the board and uh, you're just, you're just not on board with a lot of it. Yeah. You know, we, when we first talked about doing this, you know, you mentioned uh, we, we, we kid about this all the time, this whole kind of like smarty pants music, right? Whereas you know that they're so intelligent and you know that they're going to do something different every single time. And you can trust someone. You don't have to be on board with every single thing that they do. And some of these artists and bands are like so prolific. It's like, hey, you know what? I know they're going to put out good shit all the time, but I'm not going to be on board with all of it. But you know, if, if it fits my needs and what I like, I'll be into it. And the ones that I'm not, I won't, but I'll, I'll eagerly anticipate whatever they're going to come up with next. And we'll, we'll see what happens at that. Point. So yeah, for sure. All right. all right. There you, there you have it. Uh, do we trust these bands and artists? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, let us know in the comments if there are any uh, bands or artists that you really trust or you question your trust, or maybe you don't trust at all. I don't know. Take it whatever way you want to. Uh, I think this this was kind of fun because uh, I, I don't normally think of uh, bands and artists that I like in these terms, but I think it was kind of cool to really kind of go deep and say, well, what is my commitment to them, right? Like, how do I really feel about it? So. I thank you, Martin, for this topic. This was this was pretty interesting. All right. So That's what's going on? Uh, Contrarians, podcast, books, what do you got? Yeah, just the usual. This just regular Contrarian shows going up. History of five in five songs with Martin Popoff. Uh, podcast stuff going up once a week. And uh, martinpopoff.com for the books. I suppose one thing to mention is uh, if anybody wants to hit me up, you know, the Bowie book and the two Coopers and the damned, I've got a few where I've got some like dinged corners and stuff happening. Um, so I've got my Hertz box. That's getting a little, little full. Um, so if anybody wants to hit me up for a deal on any of that stuff, uh, we, we can talk about uh, any of that, uh, but yeah, martinpopoff.com email address is martinpeedinforamp.net. And if you follow Martin on Facebook, he's been kind of like resurrecting some of the early, early podcasts on some cool old topics. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that's a neat, in, uh, you know, uh, an experiment to see if it pops up the numbers of the old stuff. So it's like I'm, I'm posting them because I've joined so many different Facebook groups since uh, that a lot of people haven't seen. These are three years old now, those old episodes, too. And so I've been watching, you know, the analytics and you go, oh, that's kind of cool. There's a little bump there. And I, and I think I caused that bump. So there you go. There you go. I do want to mention uh, something coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, November 5th, which is a Saturday. That's a few weeks from now. Uh, Steve Keeler from Rock Fantasy and from the Hudson Valley Squares and I will be doing like a uh, joint uh, Rock Fantasy, Sea of Tranquility, Hudson Valley Squares, kind of like a record store day at Rock Fantasy in Middletown, New York. And we'll also be celebrating the 37th anniversary of Rock Fantasy, which is that exact day. So uh, if you're in the area, come on, come out. We'll be uh, talking music. You'll get to meet some folks from the Hudson Valley Squares. Uh, we'll be doing some giveaways, got some T-shirts and things, some albums and stuff to give away and uh, play some pinball shop the record store and CDs and uh, shirts and all sorts of fun stuff there. And we're going to make a day of it. That'll probably go from like noon till five or so. 
And then that evening, uh, st- uh, locally, I believe at Quinn's Pins, uh, right down the street from Rock Fantasy, there will be a very, very good Queen tribute band playing. So that's kind of like the whole day's festivity. So kind of like record store, meet up at the record store day during the afternoon, celebrating Rock Fantasy's 37th anniversary. Uh, shop for music, play some pinball, got some giveaways. We'll make it fun. Talk to the Hudson Valley Squares folks. And then uh, that evening, live Queen tribute music. So, uh, so yeah, so it'll be fun. So November 5th, Middletown, New York at Rock Fantasy. Uh, coming up here this weekend on the channel, we've got uh, the UK Connection. Tomorrow, we're going to be just doing the first of, I think, what we're going to be doing a monthly series where we're going to be talking about some uh, AOR melodic rock classics. Uh, kind of the format is we're going to be picking three. One very, very well-known, one sort of more in the underground, and one a surprising AOR album by uh, an artist or band that's not normally associated with like AOR melodic rock. And uh, we'll be talking about those three albums coming up tomorrow. And then uh, Sunday, we've got Ranking the Albums, Simon Bray from the UK Connection, and myself will be ranking the albums of 38 Special. So that's your kind of weekend schedule. And then uh, we'll see you all on Monday for the Hudson Valley Squares. So, uh, and I think the Squares episode on Monday is uh, some of us who have seen like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest of late. Uh, we're going to be talking, doing little mini concert reviews of some of the shows we've seen this past week. So uh, that'll be coming up on Monday. So uh, thanks for watching. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube all together. All the damn time. See you back here at the Funhouse next Friday for Martin Popoff. I am Pete Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care.